Give us, give us perspective, investment banking, moving over to private equity, how different is it? It's a, well, you know, the investment bankers go across a lot of different clients, a lot of around the world, and so, including government, so I had a lot of different clients. And now, of course, being in one firm is a real keen focus on building the firm, how the firm grows, what the strategy is. And then being a principal, of course, is very different than being an advisor because you live with decisions. Well, and it's coming at a time where private equity is sort of in the crosshairs in a unique way, just given how much money uh, has been raised and how popular it's been with a lot of investment firms. Take a listen to, or take a look at what Warren Buffett had to say on uh, the private equity industry. We've seen a number of proposals from private equity funds where the returns are really not calculated in a manner that I would regard as honest. It's not as good as it looks. What's your response? Well, it, so it, it, this very much depends on which firm you look at, how they report their numbers to their um, LPs. And I know that as a general industry, so there are a lot of different practices used, a lot of different firms. I, I am aware that there are some firms that report the way he's talking about. And I, I would just observe that that's not everyone and it's not the way it's done. So I, I, and I, th I think there's a transparency as long as clients see how the mm. calculations take place. That's important. Gary, um, so you've still been a banker's banker for you know 30 some years. What are all your friends on Wall Street saying right now? What worries them the most when they look at the financial industry today? I think actually it's interesting. The certainly 10 years have passed since the financial crisis. That's not the issue of the day. Uh, banks are well capitalized. There's more liquidity in the system. So I say the issues are uh, profitability. A number of lines of business and investment banking are not very profitable. The returns on capital are low. Uh, that's problematic. Uh, still separating out winners and losers. There are some number of banks that in the prior to the financial crisis had built up big trading desks big trading positions. They operated, in a sense, more like hedge funds. They didn't have great client relationships. And so the last 10 years have been really separating out the firms. If they had client relationships, they do well. Uh, those that didn't, they continue to lose ground. Are you talking about Deutsche Bank? I'm talking about a number of uh, institutions <laughs> where, but look, they did fall on the side. Certainly before the financial crisis, they built up a very big balance sheet that was based on taking a lot of risks, using securitizations and other aspects, and did not have as deep a client uh, base as, say, Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. Okay, so wear either or both hats. You're an investment banker advising Deutsche Bank right now what to do, or you're in private equity. Is there an opportunity there? So I'm going to pass on both. I will say, you know, Christian Sewing has one of the hardest jobs in the world. Actually, never mind just financial services. It is a very difficult situation, so there's no easy answer, I have to say, looking from the outside. You could look and say, maybe there's some of this and some of that, but it's, it's a very difficult task he has. They missed out on a really big deal when it came to the Commerce Bank merger. So what happens next? Are, are there more people that may can't come into the you know, European bank consolidation game, or do they just keep unraveling? I would think, well, not applying to, um, to, to Deutsche Bank specifically, in Europe, mergers and acquisitions is not likely as the answer to solving a number of institutions. I'd look for more concentration rather than consolidation. And that is institutions have to pick which lines of business are they good, where, where do they have market share, where do they have profitability, and exit other lines of business. And that would apply to Deutsche Bank, but actually a number of other banks as well. They're still picking their segments. So you said uh, banks are safer, we're, they're in better shape in this yes. country. What about the non-banks? Because that's what we hear a lot about. We hear from regulators, we heard from some of the traditional banks as well. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going on outside the banks now that traditional banks would have done, and that's not as regular, it's not as safe. Yeah, well, so in the, the issues to look for when you look for financial risk and systemic risk are how much capital is there backing an asset pool? Is it overly leveraged? And another is liquidity. Um, most of the asset management, most of what's being talked about away from the banks, are asset managers of one type or another. If that's third parties' money and not highly leveraged, somebody may lose money, they may have issues, but it's not, it doesn't create a systemic issue and it doesn't create something that's like what we saw last time. Again, there's not that much excess leverage across firms. There, no doubt there are a few, you can go back many years ago, long-term capital mm -hmm. was highly levered in illiquid securities. Long-term capital got a major problem, but it was a singular instance. So people were right, you can, when you're less regulated, someone can go bad. But, but it doesn't mean there's a systemic problem. At the same time, you have the U.S. banks doing their biggest deals since the financial crisis yeah. again. Um, do these deals make sense? And at, at what point is 
are they too big again? At what point are they too big to manage again? I think, um, so a couple of things. One is there is a dynamic. Finally, the regulators have shown uh, that they're, they are willing to consider mergers again and large bank mergers. It's been a long time since that's been the case. So that begins to open a door. A number of banks are feeling the pressures of low interest rates with low margins and the high technology spin. So you take those two dynamics and there's a lot of logic to merging banks. Uh, having said that, there will be caution and conservatism, but I expect U.S. merger activity in banks to increase for those two reasons. And now the regulators are beginning to say, although the SunTrust BMT has not been approved yet, so it has to go through its process. Does it concern you how much money has been raised for private equity and private debt funds? No, it's still a relatively small amount of overall equity. When you look at the equity markets and say, where are companies, you could have an interesting discussion about now more is private rather than public. What does that mean for investors? But in and of itself, it's actually not in the grand scheme of the global markets. It's still a relatively small amount of the equity in the marketplace. Gary, you have had something that you had been starting while you started at Apollo also. Aside right. from Apollo, you started building a chocolate factory. Yep. Um, you've told me that you want it to be one of the biggest luxury chocolate factories in the world. How did this come about? Well, it's uh, so I think, um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think it'll be a good business. Um, the chocolate consumer has become much more sophisticated over the last 15 years. You know, people now talk about dark versus milk. And in fact, they talk about what percentage cacao. And so we're going to the next level, and that is what really matters is beans. Where do the beans come from? How are they made? And is it artisanal? So we won't be the biggest, but we'll be something very special is our proposition in the luxury. So it's a really pure chocolate. And just like now people know from Starbucks that coffee, it matters where the beans come from, what type of beans. Actually, it really matters in chocolate, but that's, uh, <laughs> so, we'll see if people come around to that. Given the fact that you've been a banker for so long and you're a senior executive at a private equity firm, mm -hmm. has being the head of a business or so deeply invested in the business, the day-to-day, -day, mm -hmm. changed your view on anything uh, than you had before? In, which, in terms of business, running a business, or it, how you view business. Is it harder to run a business than to advise a business? I, it, it, okay, it is different because you live with it longer. And so there's an element, yes, when you're an advisor, there's an aspect of, of course, you care deeply about things, but you're not responsible. And when you're an owner or when you're uh, building a business, so I'd say there's a different mindset. It has to be, you're more, you run deeper. And so advisors, by necessity, they're good at knowing a lot of global trends, a lot of global, and a lot of interactions across a lot of countries, governments, and other things. If you're an owner, you do go deep into one business at a time. And so that's just different. It's a, a, an expertise that runs horizontal versus vertical. How have your colleagues felt about this venture that you're doing on the side? I, you know, I, 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 so I have chocolate in my office so people can come to uh, and not only have a, a meeting about whatever the subjects might be, but of course I offer the chocolate to uh, help. Um, but so it's, it doesn't take that much of my time. As I say, you know, this, what I do in chocolate is instead of playing golf. So, so a lot of people play golf uh, and I don't play golf. So it's instead time now for us all to go sample some Pars chocolate, I think. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs>